you were ready. <laughs> yes, thank you. So welcome to our May 2023 Author Jam for the Collaborative Change Library. Thank you for being here, Dave, Tennyson, Rosa, Ryan, and Lisa. Theo Ford Stiegler here for Nexus and the Collaborative Change Library. And um, I have a couple of sort of housekeeping questions and I had created some slides, but I'll just I'll just share with you and and look for input. We have one uh, sort of very logistics foundational piece in that the 11 o'clock hour on Thursdays is no longer going to be available for us as a group on the Nexus slash editor site. And so we're proposing that we move our first Thursday of the month sessions up by one hour to 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, those of you that are here, if that were to happen, how many of you said I can? That's not going to work for me at all. I can do hour, it. hour earlier is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, no humongous like, oh, we can't do that. Okay. I was looking for any sort of like, here is a rationale for why that's a really bad idea, Teo. So <laughs> none, I'm going to, we'll share that out in our, uh, follow up email to this to the the community at large, and we'll see if there's any you know key feedback that has information that says here's why we really ought not do that. Then we'll come back to you with further thinking. But um, when we're done, um, and this is now probably a year and a half or so ago, but we we queried all the authors, and it seemed that the the Thursday morning was a a meaningful compromise. You never are going to catch everyone. My concern was that if we get later in the day, those of you that are in Germany and the Netherlands and so forth uh, are now at the past the end of their work day and will be unlikely to be able to participate. I realize that seven in the morning is kind of early for some folks on the on the west coast, but we'll uh, we'll go yeah, with ten a.m. Have, have their coffee we'll with. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dave. They could be have their coffee and you know at seven in the morning and right and. And rather than read the newspaper, they can talk with us. Then read the newspaper. I, um, my second housekeeping uh, question is that I'm sort of personally, and I've talked with, with Lisa and, and Steve and some of the folks on our team, and we have found that increasingly there is so much rich sharing and information in our jams that it feels like just sharing out the resources is is sort of, yes, that's one step, and here's our follow-up, and here's what you know, uh, this author pointed us to, and here is what Tennyson mentioned, and here is a resource that that Rosa recommended we check out. Um, that that's yes, something we want to continue to do, and that feels like a rich capture. But it's sort of like, where do we go to then maybe share a reflection on? Oh, now that I've read that, I really wanted to tell Rosa that you know, here is what I got from that. Is that what resonated with you? Yeah. And so the question is, if there ought to be. Uh, and and again, to use my my own thinking about it, I'm fairly hungry for that. Is there an opportunity to have sort of the asynchronous uh, conversation to say, well, what's a comment? What's a reflection on this thing that you shared beyond what we talked about in the meeting now that I've read the resource, looked at the blog post, had an idea to connect the dots for what you shared in your session? Um one potentially obvious space for that would be a LinkedIn group that would be exclusive to collaborative change library authors. So it would be a, you know, an invitation only closed group. Uh, we can create similar kinds of environments on other social media platforms. Um, at some point I am intending to actually have a space like that on our, um, my library platform where your content currently lives, where we're looking into developing and creating sort of social interactive features and community features and uh, registries um, of uh, individual authors and so forth in that space. But that's not uh, at a place that's that's ready for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Ryan is suggesting Slack. So I'm looking sort of for some input. And again, um, what is a majority of us comfortable with as as a place of engagement in that in that form um and so I, i'm curious what you all what you all think that might be um closed linkedin works out pretty well um, as, as i might mention in our conversation i spend a lot of time on linkedin and uh but i, I ultimately i like the idea of having my library provide us a 
interactive forum space that we we authors and eventually even readers can connect with us but, uh, in the meantime yeah, i think what what we're finding um and this is sort of a sidebar what we're finding in uh the conversations that we're having um when we're when we're pitching the idea of you know further building out this idea of the my library platform and the no bits uh environment that that we're looking to build is that the community building element is really something that that resonates with people as as important you know how as an author um do I leverage the fact that this is digital content in a way that I can get feedback from readers uh, and not just in, you know, this is five stars and here's my, my written review, but being able to uh, identify that individual um, too many platforms. What is, what is mighty networks, Rosa? That's the, I don't think I've ever heard of that one. Mighty networks is the newer version of Ning. Oh, okay. I actually like Ning better than mighty networks. Um, even it's less Facebook e. Uh, um, what I like about those platforms is that they have lots of opportunities to connect. So you can start a discussion thread based on a particular book. You can have individual follow up with people. You can host an event on there. You can. It's just. I don't know. I uh, uh, I love the old art of hosting thing, even though I don't think it's being, I don't think it's active anymore. Gotcha. Um, at Mighty Networks, you know, it's like it, it allows people to create smaller circles around different things. Like say a conversation around a particular book picks up, then somebody could say, oh, I'll, you know, let's create a little circle there, it, it just creates like nested circles of circles. And um, I like it better than Slack. Um, but, you know, WhatsApp is totally fine too. Yes. I was, I was going to say, uh, I, I agree with you on the mighty interacting with and engaging with the mighty networks platform. It offers a lot. I have some specific feedback from, from a, from a, a fellow practitioner who created that that this setup for mighty networks is is a is a big jump that that it's it's tech and it's not well documented um but if you if you get it there and if, and if the community is engaging and engaged with that it makes it easier but he's he's doing it all by himself and he's he's ready to to get rid of mighty networks and go to something else but yeah. um, but again everyone's experience is is different you know if if Again, if we have partnership in that administration, it could be better. So. so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little surprised because I thought that you guys were creating a digital platform, and so, like maybe this could be on your digital platform. It could be a little corner of your digital platform. No, for... it is. That is that is the intention. We just haven't had time, energy, dollars okay. to build out that that piece. And so part of part of me bringing this to you all now is that I don't want to. I don't want to wait any longer. Part of me was like, well, well, we'll have that feature on our platform. So, you know, that's when I'll lean into that and I'll invite all the authors and I'll still do that. But I'm, I, if you will, I'm looking for an interim solution. I'll share that one consideration. None of that is, is set in stone, but uh, one of your fellow authors um, whose name I just had and now it just left me again. I guess I'm getting a little bit older. Steve uh, Colbert, I think. What are you thinking? <laughs> no, it's not Mr. He doesn't have writers or, anymore, or, though. So. Or yeah. Corral. Um, no, it's, uh, yes, Rosa, Kiko Chat. What's his name? Oh, Lucas Schiffy. Lucas, Lucas, thank you. Mm. Lucas and Kiko oh, Chat. So we, one, of the, one of the thoughts is that there may be a way to integrate Kiko Chat into our platform with like an API integration or something like that and leverage that tool which yeah. then would translate well. And so here's what's going to happen in the follow-up email that goes out to all the authors. There'll be a, a link to a little Google survey form and it'll have probably, you know, LinkedIn, Kiko Chat, WhatsApp. Um, I'll, I'll look at our uh, our chat here as, you know, what is a way that you would prefer to asynchronously um, interact and engage with your fellow authors and We'll have some, you know, we'll look at who the highest vote getters were and we'll have some internal conversation and maybe I'll cycle back with Lucas 
to see how um, we can maybe uh, accelerate some of the effort to, to create that space by leveraging what he's already built. Uh, and that has, Rosa, um, and you probably know this, DicoChat has built in similar functionality in terms of being able to say, here's the author's group, and I want to have a sub-conversation that I can create that is under that umbrella or parentage or whatever that, you know, uh, Rosa and Tennyson want to co-lead a conversation around this feature, and we can ask others to contribute and be invited as they see fit. Go ahead, Ryan. I was thinking, what is the the appetite you, you have there for um, paid community? Because I think Mighty has a way that you can can offer a kind of a tiering and pay into that. Um, certainly for the author community, if you, if you're in the in the group here, there's uh, you know we would just have a, a, a boundary around privacy in terms of our ability to collaborate. But but again, I don't know if Kiko has has the ability to do a paid community, but Mighty does. It does. So, it does. So. Oh. Well, there you go. Yeah, Kiko does also. Um... Okay, so so more on that. Thank you for sort of this initial stab and feedback. Um, you know, it may be something that um, I, I don't want to manage more than than two spaces, but it may be something where you know we have the the Kiko chat, and there's also a LinkedIn one that's another option that might have a little further further reach because it's easy for me to, you know, we have some 180 I think uh, people that I would consider authors of the Collaborative Change Library and. You know, there isn't 50 of us in these monthly meetings. So uh, there seem to be layers of of engagement and interest in uh, being together in the space that maybe can be served at those different levels. Um, so thank you for for that. Um, I want to share with you that in, in thinking about sort of what direction we might um, explore this morning, uh, something that has just been almost... I had moments where I'm like, how how is this going in this direction again? Almost every conversation I've had in the last two weeks has really heavily at some point or another leaned into recognizing polarities and a, a realization that for a lot of people, um, and by people, I mean us humans in the world, there is a polarity, if you will, to lean into either or, or to lean into both end. And uh, so my <laughs> my question for you all this morning would be, what's a, what's a polarity that has been dominant or resonant or important uh, or is important for you right now? That's my, that's my invitation. Uh, work and play. Feel free to say more. Um, the the idea that I'm looking for work currently. Oh, and so Ryan, maybe most of us know each other, and I don't think not all of us know you. So part of this usually is like who you are and oh, what so, you're doing. So and who who I am? I what, skipped all, I skipped I all of that in my. I didn't do a good job setting the container at all. So the invitation is to, to to share who you are and where your feet touch the ground, and okay. then yes, feel feel free to share more about that polarity. Um, who I am, uh, Ryan Erickson. I inhabit space in Charlotte, North Carolina, with my wife, twenty six year old kid. And our benevolent dictator, Sprightly, our cat, um, sometimes benevolent. Um, I am in, a tr I've spent 25 years in the IT application services, managed services domain, um, have adopted agile software development practices as part of my practice. Um, and uh, what I basic, I've been doing this collaborative change work for a long time and have now have some articulation for it. Um, I have a musical background, uh, mm -hmm. keyboard, bass guitar, and, and my senior recital at Bowling Green State University, 1993. Um, and I'm a bass player and a uh, keyboard player. So, and, and also the idea of integrating collaborative change, work in large companies, enterprise systems with a musical articulation of that 
mm. and um making that holistic part of, of my being and how I practice in organizational musicianship, as I like to call it. Whoa. So, so that's, that's kind of where I am. And, 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 and right now in this moment, I finished um, a gig in December and I'm looking for work. Um, but I, I, the way I, I found it recently, I'm looking for work that's sensing for play. And um, but actually what I've been doing, that's what I said I was doing, but really I've been looking for play and sensing for work. Um, and that hasn't necessarily produced a lot of work yet. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what it has produced is a condition in me that, that I've, I've, I feel like I'm pregnant, that I'm ready to deliver something beautiful to the world. I don't know what it's going to look like yet. I don't know um, where it's, how it's going to live and, and how, he, she, they are, are going to be in the world, but that that's where that polarity is for me. So I've been looking for play and sensing for work and okay, I think I need, I need to shift the polarity back down here to, to looking for work for gigs and sensing for play. That's interesting. I, I would flip that a little bit, Ryan, to say for all of us, work is looking for us. Really? And uh, uh, you're switching it back probably will increase your receptors for the signals that come from wherever, from whomever. Like, oh, I know a guy. He's got these interesting ideas. You might want to give him a call. Uh, how many of us have moved a whole career ahead on the basis of work finding us? Uh, I sure did. And... Uh, uh, but it, it, it's not like a passive thing, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, I just sit here and wait for work to find me. Uh, it it takes, uh, well, the, today's jargon is branding, which I've been experiencing and, and really learning a great deal. If work's going to find you, and I'm really not looking for paid work any longer as a retiree, but I'm, I am working for the recognition and the great feeling you get when someone says, hey, Dave, I thought of you for a workshop or I have this company, you know, and I used to hear that a lot when I was full time professor and now I don't hear it anymore. So there's my uh, my speech. Work is looking for us. What's your what's your polarity, Dave? Hmm. Well, it's funny because the first thing that came to mind is rich and poor. Mm -hmm. And I'm not poor, but my wonderful, lovely single mom niece is so poor that she texted me just before this call and said, they've shut off my electricity. <laughs> so I realized that while I'm just sailing along, having a nice golf game, looking forward to this conversation with interesting people, she and hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of other people who is, are the working poor. She's working and everything mounts up on every bill, every, it's incredible. And so I've, you know, I, I can't really petition that off too much, but it certainly is a polarity that perhaps a lot of us see uh, through our relatives, friends out on the street. There's still a lot of poverty out there, guys. I can pick up. Uh, I, I got so excited there, Ryan, when you used that phrase, organizational musicianship. Just yeah. like, nice, you know, it's a like, good one. Great. Uh, because it ties into some of the deeper longings, I think, that I carry with me that probably rest in some form of artistry or poetry, uh, how we bring depth, how I bring depth in myself and how we, we, I invoke it and invite it with others. Those are all compelling things to me. And Dave, in what you just spoke, I, I relate to that one also. The, there, it's such an important narrative right now as I entertain a next wave of some of the work that I'm 
doing inviting, I, I so relate to both uh, creating that work, but also that that work is creating me or yeah. finding that work, but it's also finding me. So I find that to be a very compelling orientation. And then if I just go back to your original prompt there, Teo, of um, polarities, uh, all kinds of them, yes, but I'm just going to stay in what is my morning. And oh, by the way, I sit in a town called Linden, Utah. It's 45 minutes south of Salt Lake City. Uh, it is a it is an urban meets rural place. It's a high desert uh, yet uh, mountains kind of place. Um, this morning, I I like like is true most days for me. I I have a pretty significant to do list, and um, in the spirit of being at home and not being in a gig, so that to do list is there, <laughs> and. Um, you know, it's it's important stuff and things that are are both things that I want to get done and things that I'm avoiding getting done also. And uh, what I ended up doing this morning is is really refining all of that. I sort of pushed the to do list aside and said, following a bit of my gut and my instinct is I just need to sit and be in some open thinking right now. And so I moved over to that chair over there with curtains open and looking out into the window and actually just, just followed a bit of nothingness. Uh, how fruitful, oh my gosh, you know, like just stuff coming forward, maybe in the way that you just scribbled on your white, whiteboard there, Ryan. For me, it's like, <laughs> oh gosh, have the paper nearby because this seeming moment of nothingness feels so freaking rich and full and exactly what I needed, exactly what the doctor ordered. So if I try to bring that, bring that back into a polarity, for me, there's something about the planned and the unplanned and how rich the unplanned can be is part of where my heart continues to reach. I'll offer that at least as one of one of those polarities that I'm working with. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Rosa, tell us what you're thinking. You, you're very responsive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, I, I'd love to build on that because this morning, like most mornings, I feel like I just, you know, I give myself some time for inspiration and spontaneity and whatever. And I've got such a long list of to-dos, but, but that it just feels like that's where my creativity lives, you know, uh, is, is just being really gentle with myself on, with the transition from asleep to awake and just, you know, writing down snippets of dreams or just like, just being really gentle with that transition and then inspiration comes and then I, you know, do something and it's not on my list and, and whatever, but it, it feels like it's part of what nourishes my soul. Um, but the, the transition, the, the polarity that I want to talk about, I had a, this might be a little heavy. I don't, uh, someone was saying the other day that they don't like the word trigger warning because trigger is guns and whatever. So kind of relanguaging that. And I don't, I don't know that we've landed on anything, but oh, big breath warning or something. Um, last night I watched, oh, and I'm, I'm sitting in the Berkshire mountains in Massachusetts. So it's, very rural and that's where home is in a little town called Great Barrington. Um, Daniel Schmachtenberger. Mm. Uh, uh, there he is again, Ryan. Yeah. So <clears throat> my friend and colleague and mentor, Tom Atley sent out a little email to several of us uh, the other day after he had posted his new blog post on AI stuff. So after he posted this whole blog post and then somebody sent him this video, um, Daniel Schmachtenberger in conversation with, I haven't learned her name 
yet. She is new to me, but he's anyway, this whole I, I, this whole idea of Moloch is this ringing a bell? Um, I can post the link to the video afterward, but um, the uh, I need to move as I say this. Um, it really harkens to your the thing that you said, Teo, at first about the either or or the both and because Moloch is the name that some people are giving to the god of dom domination or either or or and the vicious loop of the arms race right that it in that game it's like you're in that very toxic game you're pulled into getting bigger weapons because otherwise you know and it's just like this death spiral so it's like the god of the death spiral that our culture is in and so what he was saying about ai which is a which is ultimately a lose lose game, right? We see it as a win lose game, but the win lose game is a lose lose game. And so he was saying that um, we already have a world system which is this big autonomous intelligence which is driving most of us who are in it in varying degrees and that it's that system that's creating the AI. So that system is not aligned. So how can we have AI if our world system is not aligned, right? Because alignment, basically the way the AI people are using it, meaning that it's not, it's going to help humans, right? Well, our current world system isn't designed to help humans. And that's the system that's driving the AI. Anyway, it's really, really, really worth watching. Um, and I was just writing an email this morning to some of my professors at Fielding uh, to send them info to share with current students, et cetera. Um, but basically there's a weird way that I end up really hopeful with the I mean, there's a crap load of shit going on, but with the conversation that is emerging about what does it really mean to be human, uh, there was an article by an AI person, Eliezer or something, or other, I haven't learned his name yet, is basically saying, well, the, the real problem is we haven't figured out how to teach computers to care. And it's like, so caring, values, it's like this conversation is emerging about what does it really mean to be human? And that's what we need to be talking about, right? And how do we create humane systems just of our current world system? And once we can do that, then I don't mean once because it's not a linear sequential thing, but but doing that is an intrinsic part. It's like creating aligned societies is an intrinsic part of creating aligned AI. And um, so this thing about... Ah, in ancient OD, it used to be called primary mentality and secondary mentality. So primary mentality was, you know, me or you, uh, individual or the group, et cetera. And then they called secondary mentality like the me and you or the kind of group where the more that I am myself, the more I contribute to the group, the more the group contributes to us. But it's actually backward because from an indigenous perspective, we would say that primary mentality comes first and we've all been socialized into the Moloch secondary mentality that, you know, into the other one anyway. Um, so that's all in my dissertation. Or, so so know, dare I say the polarity you're proposing is Moloch and Ubuntu? Yes, yes, yes. Moloch and Ubuntu. Thank you. I don't for, know. For the son Ubuntu of a Hebrew is... professor that Moloch is, is, that's pretty heavy duty. Oof. I feel much better, Dave, that you didn't connect on it because I was like, "Oh my gosh, I gotta." Catch I up. don't know what it is. Um, well, Ubuntu is a. Is a uh, I know what I, ancient, now. I'm learning, but please. Yeah, ancient Hebrew. What's well, not an a Hebrew deity, but it shows up in the Hebrew scriptures as a. It was one of the foreign gods that would be juxtaposed with Yahweh, one thing, and Moloch, the other thing. Like, ah. okay. Um, and and it's been adopted by people in in talking about the uh, potential of of evil inherent in 
AI and machine learning. Um, and and what is Ubuntu? Ubuntu is um, is it Swahili? It's one of the South African language sounds like um, it. languages, and it represents I am because we are. It's that it's that secondary mentality that that Rosa described. Yeah, in cool. the Mayan, it's like in Lakesh, Halakan, I am you, and you are me. Hmm. It's that it's that sense. Yeah. I also again, again, Rosa, you have hit a nerve with me. I've been traveling this this <laughs> um, space for a couple months, um, based on a podcast that Daniel did with a guy named Kevin Iwaki on the a Green Pill and a Green Pill podcast. I will share it in the links as well. Um, but one thing about Moloch that I had not learned, and and just in in my travels was the essay from uh, the Slate Star Codex essay of Meditations on Moloch. In my master class, I'm going to teach you the same tool. Oop. Oop. But uh, so, so again, that's, it, it's, it's a, there are lots of YouTube recordings of it as well, but the idea of Moloch also from Allen Ginsberg's uh, Howl, um, that he refers to Moloch as this malign force that is the, Oh, it's pretty crazy, um, mm. and and um, it's almost like problems that are that are too big for for just a couple of people to think about. That there's a need for a global coordination and a loving coordination that we might collaborate and be with each other in the spirit of going somewhere else that 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 force is is has drawn us to from our lizard brains. Yeah. Thank you so much Ryan I uh and, and apologies I was looking for the link for the Daniel Schmachtenberger conversation because I realized that you were just talking about a different one which I don't think I've seen that different one um uh, but this what you said that gave me chills was this thing about Oh, Liv Boere is her name, and she's the one who has been really big on the on the Moloch thing uh, as a metaphor. Um, this thing that this is too much for our individual nervous systems to handle, and that we need to be like sitting and breathing together, as you invited us to do at the very beginning, you know, in order to create the collective nervous system where we can begin to process any of this stuff, right? And then taking breathing pauses throughout as needed <laughs> because mm -hmm. it isn't about blowing ourselves out of the water. It's about finding ways to connect with our hearts and with our heads both, right? So, yeah, thank you. I, I just want to lean, really lean into, into that thought, Rosa, because that to me is one of the... Uh, I don't know what the, what the right label is, but you know our technology has gotten to a place where it is so interconnected and interlinked, and I can literally do something on these keys right now that that affects a, a server that is near near where Tennyson lives, right? And it's like this moment, and there is an actual thing like there's a zero and a one and a bunch of them that are somewhere created somewhere that I so. As humans, we still seem to a lot of times fall back into the me, myself, and I, and I can, but we're now up against our own technology that we've built that is so interlinked and interconnected and, you know, blockchain as a concept, being able to leverage a bunch of computers versus one computer. And so why as humans, aren't we leaning into that opportunity to, to be that interconnected and you know, some of us are trying to, or, but some of us are <laughs> no. Keep that away from me. Um, I don't think there's a practice for that that most people have developed. A, a practice for for doing what we've just described. Um, however, I think there's a group uh, of scholars who I encounter constantly through social media because i'm always looking for new people to join my podcast and that's philosophers and it strikes me that here i was in a business school about 200 yards from where our philosophy 
faculty resided. For 30 years, I only time I would see a philosophy professor is if we were in the same meeting. Shame on me, because the question of what does it mean to be human is the fun, from my standpoint, is why we have philosophers who, who, and that's their question. And they may have, uh, as some of the folks already been cited in this conversation, some terrific answers to why we haven't put more of our humanity into practice and regarding connecting with others. Um, so what's your thought on that, Rosa? Well, I, it's just a resource. Uh, whoops, did I unmute? Yeah. Um, the, there's a group of people in the UK that just want to say the UK is so far ahead of the US yeah. in so many areas right now. But there's a group of people who are doing these things called huddles, which is exactly that, like developing technologies, social technologies for, for you know, huddling and like that. And they have a big, huge grant to work on um, um, collective imagination. Mm. And they're doing it in a very open source way. And I'm happy to send links to where you can get more information about it. So it's like, but this whole technique of how do we, um, oh, and there's also uh, Richard, um, one of the founders of, um, of Lumio, uh, which is another of these software tools. And he he is doing this work called micro solidarity networks, which is also exactly that. Like how do we get really good at forming small groups that have each other's backs for dealing with the major war problems that we have right now. So there, there are these wonderful little experiments. And of course we need, you know, way more of it. Um, but I will uh, put those links in after. They're called huddles, H U D D L E S. H U D D L E S. And that then the so other cool. thing is micro solidarity. Mm. And so those are two different people who are working very much along the same lines. And um, and then there's the collective imagination thing, which includes huddles, but it's specifically in yeah. So Richard Bartlett? I think so, yes. Wow. There's good stuff going on around the world. It's just how the hell do we know from our positions of is somewhat isolated position? And look at us, you know, we're we're at least peeking over the sides of our walls to see what's going on out there. There's probably millions of people who don't. <laughs> they just stay behind the wall. But once you look over the wall, and this is what I've discovered now 213 podcasts in, is that there are tremendous amount of interesting people. Like for a quick example, I, I had a podcast conversation with Hillary Bradbury, who was on one of our symposia. And uh, she talked about all of these, almost like fireflies of engagement going on around the issues of, the, of today and tomorrow, all over. And, you know, not on camera, but afterwards expressing some frustration that while she sees one firefly gloop over here, she'd love to zip over there and help them in, learn from their convening abilities what they can translate into action research. Whoops, there's another firefly group over here. And so I think I asked her the Luddite question. Well, where where you see a lot of fireflies back here in the United States? She's in Ireland now. Well... Not quite. And some stuff out, maybe we've got some kind of a, a cloud of opacity over this country right now, because I hear over and over, oh, you got to go to South, uh, South Africa. You got to go to Ireland. You got to go to uh, Thailand. I mean, there's places where people are saying, screw it. We're just going to get together and figure these things out. While over here, we're saying, you know, it's AI or us. We're, we're might as well give up, give AI the the game. So Tennyson, I want to know your experience because you are seeing life very differently than what yeah, I, I, I think I would just put in a few things here uh, that string together in my own uh, belly and heart and mind in today's call. Um, because I think that there are a lot of pockets of people doing things. 
And uh, I think there is a movement or a reclaiming perhaps of the importance of the smaller scale present moment right here, right now stuff. And that contrasts some of the larger scaled narratives that have been so present in the OD field for a long time. Yeah. And let's not lose ourselves again in an either or construct there. All of that matters. But I, I tend to uh, find my way with a lot of small groups of people who are asking the very questions, Rosa, that you were naming, like, what does it mean to be human? Or what does it mean to be human in this context with one another? Or even with greater specificity, how might we practice kindness and love together? And that has a lot to do with our days at the office, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And I would suggest, I, 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 I think I hope this is true. Hmm. No, I'll go stronger than that. I think this is true, is that there's a, there's a, a consciousness movement that values or even prioritizes the, the localness of things. Or in the language, I think that you just brought in, Rosa, something about the, the micro solidarity networks, like that just, you know, it, it, it called to me in concept, it calls out the, the potency of perhaps not being able to, you know, be with the, the scale of the world's problems, but I can gather with my neighbors yeah. or I can gather with my team, you know, and I'm glad to see that lifted up again, uh, with, with such, um, uh, uh, vigor and then I, I'm still going back to the line that you spoke in, Rosa, about um, catches my attention too much for an individual nervous system to handle. Like what, a, what an interesting framing that way mm -hmm. to notice some physiological or emotional or biological um, uh, boundaries that... Uh, uh, that point to not being able to metabolize just individually. So metabolizing in communal ways, holy shit, man. You know, I think that's what a lot of us are up to these days. And sometimes that goes with, you know, great um, receptivity and impact. And sometimes it's like just little tiny things that I'd like to think contribute to a movement within our field. Mm. So all, all of that stirs within me, um, but, but somehow how we link together the philosophizing and the practice and the poetry and the artistry and, and the, the music <laughs> and, and the music and the ongoingness of, uh, you know, that like, like this is the question that so many of us live in. We, we try to practice locally and locally could still be very, very big scale. Um, but, you know, you also contribute to a networked imagination of things yeah. Yeah. like that's freaking cool. Right. I, yeah. I'll wow. I, I got to jump in there. Uh, uh, there's so many places <laughs> I wanted to jump in and be with there that. Um, the, the core issue, I think we're talking about what is our 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 calling and our job to be human mm. to be more human how might we be the most human in in what we do and how we are and i think the the, the moloch polarity is it's around moloch is about coordination failure and mm. and and that that we are rivalrous as human beings you know listening to that lizard brain um and coordination the ai's can immediately coordinate individually without any any interaction but we humans aren't 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 capable of that that's just by our nature that we need this spirit between us we need this love between us to coordinate and and that that is i think think the call that that's why it's it can't be enough for one nervous system to handle because that's that, that's not how we how we as spiritual as carbon beings that's how that's how it's us carbon and water folks uh, deal with stuff instead of the silicon folks you know but yes we have to play with them 
yes, <laughs> yes, we have to teach them to love. That and that they don't know how to love. We've we've created them without love. Yeah. How might they learn to love? And how might we learn to love them so that they may love us back in some way, in the way that 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 we can be together and not just turn our planet into a a, a blackened husk of of dirt. You know? mm. Yike. <sighs> I'm curious where you are, Lisa, and all of your thinking here. Yeah. My, there's like so many things to connect with, but I'll try to rattle off a few. <laughs> First is I'm Lisa out here in southeastern Michigan in the U.S. And to connect with Ryan a little bit, um, June 1st will be 24 years with Thomson Reuters in a technical role. Um uh, yeah. for, for quite a while, uh, consulting for our software, but then now a team lead of the technical group and, uh, and add that my favorite thing to do is sing. So, um, there oh, you go. And, There's the combination. Oh, and Lisa just graduated on Friday with a graduate degree in organization development and change. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was going to be the next thing because it relates to the yeah, I polar you were gonna... polarity. Yeah, I was going to go there, but thank you for that. Uh, so for a polarity sense, uh, for that sense of, of uh, speaking to confidence, Friday was commencement, and but the uncertainty of what's next and just thinking in terms of that. And so that also made me connect to Dave with the rich and poor, but less in, say, a monetary sense, but in a learning sense when I was busy getting rich with knowledge what was I poor in? I was poor in probably seeing my family and seeing, you know, making those human connections as much as I might have, particularly throughout the summer last year, I was fully in school and not going back to my hometown and all that, that type of thing. And so I think that leads also then back to the AI discussion. My company for sure is investing in AI. And so again, there's a richness of what might be possible with an AI, but then what will that um, polarity of what, what could we become poor in if we're not paying attention to how we're doing, how we're using it, that kind of thing, let alone um, social impact, but also the, the business impact. So I'll be probably in the thick of that in the, in the coming months and years of what that actually means for our company and for our people and for, um, the customers and, and their clients that are using our system because there's great possibilities for their um, just being efficient. But again, what's that that flip side? So I think That's I it. tried to cover as many things as I heard <laughs> that oh, related to me. Yeah. So, Terrific. but but mm-hmm. I'm just trying to um, not be afraid of that uncertainty and just just kind of you know be here with folks like you that can spark new ideas for me and and uh as you you all are my mentors well you got to keep coming back you know you don't have to write a chapter to get into this group lisa you've earned your way in (laughs) yeah well what was funny was our professor particularly said friday's commencement grades aren't done till may 3rd so she was like is your professor oh or your professor's not on this call. So. Not on this call. No, no, no. May 4th. Not a, not a, so that's what I mean. So yesterday was the actual, yeah. my mother said, should I tell my ladies that you graduated? Because, uh, you know, it's on Friday. <laughs> because mm. grades weren't done until yesterday. So. But it's if, official. So If they haven't told you, haven't told you you're at risk, you're not at risk. So, so Lisa, so I... I I want to jam, I want to jam or riff on the uh, polarity that I heard in what you said. And it's a core polarity that, that I feel is part of you know, the, how I want to traverse the world. It's the polarity between fear and love. And that where do we choose? What do we choose yeah. when we reach that? Yeah. Like what, to me, it's, you know, when you're getting rich in something, what are you blinded to? Right. And, and just what, what do you not see happening until it's had a huge impact? Well, it's a, it's a wonderful new way of thinking of greed in the best sense. I'm greedy to know what I missed. I'm greedy to have conversations like we're having today. Uh, and yes, I'm, uh, it means I have to drop something else in order to do this. But if we lose the sense of 
really, really wanting the richness of reading and conversations and all the rest, then we're doomed. I, I, and I don't think AI has gotten greedy yet, but we can be greedy or we can give it a whole new definition. Uh, because, you know, I'm going to be 80 in less than two weeks and uh, I am really greedy for life now <laughs> because I keep looking at the short end of the stick now. And uh, I, I don't want to, you know, go sit in a chair and uh, I, not tennis and sitting in a chair is not what I'm talking about. I, I, I don't want to sit in a chair in a nursing home, you know, like not knowing who I am <laughs> to make it really bad. So I'm greedy for every bit of noise, distraction, attraction, uh, abstraction, you name it. Uh, I want to, I want it all. And I want it now. <laughs> there's, there's a song in that. <laughs> right. I was singing that in my head just then. <laughs> I'm like the little girl in uh, in that uh, Willy Wonka uh, uh, chocolate factory story. Uh, Daddy, I want it now. Remember that if you saw the I original movie. I want it all. <laughs> yeah. I want the whole world. Gretchen, I think her name was. <laughs> Baruka Salt. Baruka. Yes, there you go. <laughs> so... Anyway, so sorry for more, blowing if away more our Gretchen, last couple of minutes. Hmm? If, we're more, if, we, if we can be more Gretchen for Ubuntu, we, we might just be okay. There's the rap right there. Be well, a Gretchen for Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a phrase I thought I would hear today. <laughs> I, it's not a phrase I thought I would speak today. <laughs> well played. <laughs> We've dragged Teo way, way into the weeds. <laughs> I love so, and I just want to say, you know, this, we are doing this here right now, right? Teo, we, that's why this author jam means so much to me because you are offering people an opportunity to connect in this right. way that we're talking about. So yes, we want more of it. Yes, it might sometimes look like the grass is greener other places, but uh, but here we are doing it right now, right here. And it's a truly valuable opportunity you are offering us. Yeah. And um, I just want to mention a couple of different things I put on the chat. The Horizons Project in the US is something that is just really cool. <laughs> I mean, they're looking at how do we shift our awareness of the power of narrative to bridge divides while still being aware of the importance of social justice. So not like just saying, okay, we're all equal and we need to cross divides. Anyway, they're, they're doing really good work. Uh, Claudia Chwalitz, that's not US based, but um, um, this she wrote this amazing essay, A New Democracy Defined by Joy, Agency, Dignity, Wonder, and Being in Relationship, which I, I just love to share it with people because uh, I've been working in the collaborative governance space, as those of you who were here last week know, like kind of applying OD skills in that area. I am so happy about this book, which came out last year, but somehow I missed it because I've been in dissertation tunnel vision, um, <laughs> High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out by Amanda Ripley, who I've known about because she wrote a wonderful article called Complicating the Narrative. Mm -hmm. which is precisely about that, how we get away from us and them polarizing kind of narratives. Uh, she's a journalist, investigative reporter, really good. This book, Warning, I thought I was taking a nonfiction book to bed with me and I would read a chapter and then fall asleep. I was up till three o'clock in the morning. I have not <laughs> finished it, but it, it, it has like all these real life stories and it. it's like as gripping as a good novel. Mm -hmm. um, so, and um yeah, and so Claudia Schwalitz is also the co-founder of this Democracy Next thing, which is calling for applying citizen deliberation to the issue of how do we do AI governance. And so that's just a really positive, I mean, I don't know if it's going to succeed, if it's going to take care of it, if it's enough, whatever, but I just get so heartened when I see people's creativity and initiative and imagination being applied to all of these challenges that we are facing. Wow. So, so Lisa, you, you, you can't stop reading now. You must go on because you just had about three terrific books and essays cited here. So you know, none of this, I'm done with school now. I can, you know, 
Well, you know, that's why I binge said, watch uh, Netflix shows. <laughs> you can do that. That's too. why I said it was the uncertainty of what's next. Yeah, you well, you're eliminating uncertainty, right? We just got <laughs> your reading list right yeah. there on the chat. <laughs> Res wrestling with uncertainty. Um, re regrettably, I have to check out for another call that I'm now five minutes late for. And, um, and I and was, I do want to honor honor your time. Um, yeah. and just say thank you. Um, yeah, it's great, I guys. I'm, I'm pretty sure none of you are AI bots, so I, I think it takes it takes uh, carbon water people for this to happen, and I'm I'm grateful for it. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks. Thank See you. you next month. Yeah.